Hi, and thank you for watching. In today's video, I would like to share some amazing information with you that our Heavenly Father has given me over the past two weeks or so regarding His harvest model and how it applies to the time right before us. All of what I will show you today serves to confirm what He showed me a little over four years ago. From all the videos on my channel, I believe the series on the first resurrection and how this is tied to the harvest and temple models is probably the most important of all videos I have ever posted because the understanding that it brings allows one to see the truth of God's word in extreme clarity and it resolves the contention that often exists between several different views that Christians hold over various subjects. I'm also saddened by the fact that even though the series has been available for more than four years, fewer than 40,000 people have watched the first video in the series. So for those who have not watched the series yet, and if you are not familiar with the concepts of God's harvest, Today's video may leave you with more questions than answers and I would really recommend that you watch the series before continuing further. For those who are familiar with the harvest and temple models and the related concepts, I hope that today's video will be a blessing. Our Heavenly Father has shown me several brothers and sisters dreams or visions over the past two weeks that have to do with His harvest, the condition of His harvest and the process of harvesting with which our Savior will soon gather in what belongs to Him. What I find really exciting is when our Heavenly Father confirms the concepts that are given to us in His Word through dreams or visions that are given to His children, especially when the person receiving the dream or vision may not have a full understanding of what it was that they were shown. When this happens, I know that the message comes from our Heavenly Father, because even though the person who receives the message may not know what it means, the message aligns perfectly with the Word of God. Often it also expands our understanding and uncovers even deeper insight into what we read in God's Word. I know many shun all forms of prophecy or visions and dreams, but if our stance is that the gifts of the Spirit no longer operate in the church, then we may as well rip out 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 from God's Word. In addition, I have found so much comfort in seeing God's prophecies in my own life being fulfilled over the past few years that there is no way in which anyone would be able to convince me otherwise. The first vision that I would like to point out is one that a sister in Christ shared on August 21st of 2022, and as you will see, she explains that the vision left her shaken and saddened and not knowing what to do. Now before we look at what she saw, I would like to give a little background, especially to those who have not watched the series on the Harvest and Temple models. In 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9, we are told that we are God's husbandry or harvest and His building or temple. So whatever is shared in the Word of God with regards to the harvest or temple also applies to those who belong to Him. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. If you have studied the biblical harvest and temple models, you will know that both of these consist of three portions. There is quite a bit said about each portion in various books that allows one not only to obtain an understanding of each portion and what it represents, but it also clarifies several other subjects over which there often exist major divisions within the church. I have often shared this simple graphic to illustrate the three portions associated with God's harvest, which consist of the first fruits which belong to God, then we have the owner's portion that he harvests and takes home with him, and finally we have the gleanings or the corners of the field that are left in the field to the poor and the stranger. The basics are described to us in Leviticus 23 as shown next. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall weigh the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. This is really just the basics when it comes to understanding the harvest model, but it is certainly the foundation on which our understanding of God's harvest should be built. In the vision that our sister in Christ will share with us next, she is shown the owner's portion and the gleanings, and it is interesting to see how our Heavenly Father differentiates between these two portions in this instance. 
But I will also show you how our Heavenly Father has provided us with scriptures to support what is shown. I will also share other prophecies that will further confirm what we will look at next, showing us that all of the information originates with the same source, our Heavenly Father, who is now pouring out His Spirit over all flesh. Let us listen to a condensed version of her vision, and I will comment where required. God said, you know, in the last days He, he will give prophecies even to the women, He'll give dreams and visions to the men, and so forth and so forth. Well, anyway, He gives gifts. The Holy Spirit gives gifts severally as He wills. It is His will, God's will, to give us spiritual gifts. So if He wants to give us a vision, <clears throat> that's exactly what He'll do. So the other day, as I was visiting with Karen at the kitchen table, sitting across, um, I started to, there started to form a vision in my mind's eye, just in my mind's eye. So I put my hand up and I said, Karen, I said, just, just don't, don't say anything because I'm getting, I'm getting a picture from the Lord. And so everything was quiet and I want to tell you what I saw. Now what I saw, I'm going to back up with scripture as best that I can. Because the scriptures that I will read are even a bit difficult. These scriptures are a bit difficult to interpret. But first I'm going to tell you the, the vision. This shakes me to my core. This makes me sad and it makes me wondering what steps to take next. And before I tell you the vision, I want to say if you feel extra pressure in your life and you're just being pressured from one end and then another end and you're just feeling crunched and you can't keep up with things there's so many things to keep up with and you're just you're just almost tormented with these continual pressures in your life well that the word for pressure is tribulation the word for tribulation in the bible is pressure look it up in your concordance So everything's in high pressure lately. Here's the vision. I saw a field. I saw a field of lovely brown soil. I'm a gardener. So when I saw this lovely brown soil, rich soil, I thought, oh, that's really pretty. And then I saw plants. They looked a little bit like corn, like corn stalks. And I saw them popping up, germinating. They were all germinating, coming to life. In other words, when you plant a seed, it's got to come to life. Jesus said, except you plant a seed of, or a, a grain of uh, wheat, you know, it's got to be planted first and then it grows. So what I saw in my vision had been planted by God. And what I saw were lives, human lives, being represented by living plants. So these plants began to pop up out of this rich brown soil. And they were more in the center of the field, although few were on the outskirts, you know, around about. And then I see these other plants that are of the same venue, the same variety, I, I should say, the same variety, and they're now popping up more around the edges, more around the edges, and they're stronger, and they're taller, and they're brighter in color, and they look healthier. They look a lot healthier and a lot bigger. They were like three times, okay, the plants in the middle were maybe about, say, eight inches high. The plants around the edge were more, more like a foot high, stronger and healthier and brighter. And as I saw the plants in the middle, they began to get tired and they began to wither a little bit. They didn't die, 
standing there in the ground. They weren't dead, but they began to weaken a little, and some of them were kind of slumped over, you know, like uh, when a plant doesn't receive enough nourishment, it doesn't receive enough, you know, uh, life from the soil, it begins to kind of wither, and then pretty soon it'll kind of tip over, and it'll it'll still be alive, but it won't be healthy. It will not be as healthy as these strong plants around the edges that were still standing very strong and very bright and very healthy. And then suddenly, this is what, this is the hard part. Suddenly, I saw a huge hand, a man's hand, came down out of heaven and began to pluck up the weak plants. And he would pluck up a handful, and then he'd turn his hand up and send these plants to heaven. And then again, his hand would come down, and he'd pluck more. He did this, I think, three times. He'd pluck more, return them to heaven, and then finally, again, and then that was all. And that left the strong plants standing, but the weaker ones, the tired ones, that were just tired, wore out, weak. God had plucked them up with his holy hand, personally removing them and taking them to his holy heaven. So I told that, let me think, I believe that was, that was all, of, that was all. She continues to provide her understanding of this vision, but it is not interpreted using God's harvest model that he provided for us in his word, and that is clearly referenced in what was shown to her. In the interest of time, I'm not going to show you her interpretation now, but you are welcome to watch it by using the link provided in the description below. From what our Heavenly Father has shown me over the years, he is clearly showing her the two remaining portions of the faith harvest, with Jesus' portion that he will take home with him being represented by the weaker stalks, and the gleanings or the corners of the harvest represented by the stronger stalks. The question now is, why did the Holy Spirit choose to show God's portion as weaker, while the gleanings are represented as stronger? There are a few passages from the word that shed light on this, and please keep these in mind as we will also look at other prophetic words that will further confirm these for us. Hope deferred maketh a heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. For many of God's children, the past five years have been a continual situation of hope being deferred. Many were watching and anticipating the arrival of their bridegroom to be sooner rather than later, just to be disappointed when their hopes were deferred on multiple occasions, ending up with a heart that is sick. This vision shows the effect of hope that was deferred and having a sick heart, and becoming a weak and withered stock. Not only did these children of God have to deal with the disappointment of their hope being deferred, but they also had to endure ridicule and scoffing, not only from the world, but even more so from fellow Christians. I am amazed to see how many there are out there calling themselves Christians, whose only purpose would seem to be to criticize other Christians. Worst of all is that the most vicious attacks on Christians who are desiring and watching for the return of their bridegroom would seem to be coming from other Christians who do not have the same desire. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Are there other reasons why God would choose the weak over the strong? There is a very specific passage that highlights this for us. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. 
From this passage, we see that our Heavenly Father prefers those things that are weak and those things that are despised by the world to confound the mighty, the strong, and those who are wise in their own eyes. Given that the sister was shown that the different stalks are of the same crop, we can also see how our Heavenly Father is differentiating between two groups of believers. One group is identified as weak and the other group is strong or mighty. In Matthew 5, we find even more evidence pointing to the qualities of the weak and withered stalks that our Heavenly Father desires, and these are very important to take note of to compare oneself with as we approach the time of harvest. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. We have to ask ourselves on a daily basis, am I being persecuted for Jesus' sake, or am I the one persecuting other brothers and sisters in Christ? over petty issues? Am I the one starting a fight with a fellow brother or sister in Christ, or am I the one who steps in to end a fight? Is my behavior towards others loving, or am I hurting others with my words or actions? Is my focus on Jesus, or am I focused on myself? As I've shown in previous videos, the Bible clearly shows us that those who glory in their own flesh, or the works that they do for Christ, that they may think are wonderful, may find that the bridegroom will tell them that he never knew them, even though they operated in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. All of our works are tainted with sin, and we cannot offer our Heavenly Father anything that we do or that we are as the reason for entry into His kingdom. Only through the blood that Jesus shed for us on the cross, as payment for our sins, and placing our faith and trust in Jesus as being the only begotten Son of God, can we obtain entry into the kingdom of God. Those who offer Jesus their good works are standing before him in dirty garments, and these will have to cleanse those garments during the tribulation, as explained to us in Revelation 7. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. We also know that what was shown to the sister in this vision relates to the parable of the ten virgins, as well as the parable of the good and evil servants, and that this division between a group that is of the same crop is easily understood by the harvest and temple models. Many believe that God will take all saved believers in the rapture, but that is simply not supported by God's word, and the many parables and models that are provided for us to obtain the correct understanding of this. Those who do believe that Jesus would take the entire crop for himself is shown by, the, by his word to lack intimacy with him, and they assume that he would break his word to force people to be part of something that they may not have a desire for. We serve a loving God who allows people to choose for or against him whether they are saved or not. I also believe that the word shows us that our Heavenly Father has a plan to reconcile His entire creation with Him, and that this may occur over several ages to come, where Jesus will show us more of His love towards us, while continuing to reconcile more of His creation with Him, and these two concepts being supported by the following passages. 
For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Have you ever wondered what it means when the word of God shows us that all things, even things that are in heaven, will be reconciled with God? What is the extent and implications of this, and have you ever wondered what things in heaven need reconciliation with God? When reading Hosea chapter 2, we see Israel recognizing their Messiah and calling him Ishi, which only happens when they have seen their Messiah with their eyes, and the earliest at which this could happen would be at Jesus' second coming. So Israel will call their Messiah Ishi during the time of the millennial reign of Christ. However, here we see that Jesus will make a covenant on behalf of Israel with the beasts of the earth, with the fowls of the air, and with the creeping things. These are always references to fallen angels, demons, the unclean spirits, and those of mixed seed, or the Nephilim. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shalt call me no more Baalai. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword, and the battle out of the earth, and will make them to lie down safely." We also see in Isaiah 43 that these unclean creatures will glorify our Heavenly Father when He does a new thing. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. The question that very few are asking is, how do these passages align with the fact that the word of God shows us that Satan is chained up and cast into the bottomless pit at the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ for a thousand years, being prevented from interfering in the lives of people during the millennium? while we see the unclean creatures on the earth at this time, entering into a covenant with Jesus for Israel's sake, and glorifying Jesus when he does a new thing and provide waters in dry places. Have you ever wondered about this before, and do you understand how this fits in with God's plan of being reconciled with all of his creation? Should the fallen angels and demons and those with the mark of the beast not be with Satan in the bottomless pit at this time? Why are they shown to be on the earth glorifying our Heavenly Father instead of being in chains with their master who is Satan? And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Most Bible teachers would avoid an understanding in which it would ever be possible for our Heavenly Father to be reconciled with all of his creation, but does such an understanding align with what the Word of God shows us? Another question to ask involves the following passages. I have trodden the winepress alone. And of the people was none with me, for I will tread them in my anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God." When Jesus treads the winepress alone, what happens to the wine that is produced from this process, and to whom does the grape harvest belong? If your answer is that the wine that represents those who will rise to fight with Jesus at his second coming belongs to Satan, 
then that would imply that when Jesus treads the winepress, he is actually working for Satan to bring in Satan's harvest. And we know that this is certainly not true, since we have just seen how Satan is chained in the bottomless pit for a thousand years at this time. The only conclusion one can draw is that the grape harvest in full also belongs to Jesus, and even though this harvest is harvested by being crushed under the feet of Jesus, this is all his property. I have already shared a video in which I show how God plans to rescue those who were stolen by the enemy during the time leading up to Jesus gathering in his harvest, and once again, none of this would be understood without the understanding of the biblical harvest and temple models. In addition, I believe the fact that Jesus waited so long to gather in his harvest, leading to his portion of the faith harvest becoming withered and weak, was absolutely intentional, with our Heavenly Father's desire for reconciliation with his creation at the center of this delay. Be patient therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. With Jesus waiting very patiently for the harvest, and longer than most believed he would, the enemy overplayed his hand and began stealing from God's harvest before the time appointed for Satan to receive a portion. This transgression by our enemy will lead to Satan having to make restitution, as per Proverbs 6. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry, but if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold, he shall give all the substance of his house. This means that even the fallen angels, demons and unclean spirits, and those of mixed seed, may become Jesus' property through restitution that Satan will have to make for his transgression of God's harvest law, and this happening at the start of the millennial reign of Christ. This would explain clearly the reason for Jesus entering into a covenant with them during the millennium, and these also shown to be glorifying Jesus during the millennium. If they were all in the lake of fire or in the bottomless pit, these passages from Hosea and Isaiah would certainly not be possible. Also note that the method by which these will be reconciled with God will be very different to those who are saved by grace through faith and they will certainly not have the same position in the coming ages as those who have become the sons of God, to whom Jesus' righteousness was imputed. Coming back to the vision, what about the strong stocks, and what does the word of God show us about them? Our sister refers to them as the fighters, and we know that they are particularly focused on fighting with the weaker stocks. This is particularly described to us in the parable of the evil servants, which identifies the stronger stocks as the evil servants, who are beating their fellow servants, and who are not expecting or preparing for their master's return. But and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink, and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. These also reference the lukewarm Christians who believe that being saved allows one to continue to live in sin without the fear of any consequences for doing so. Adopting this view does not rob a person of their salvation. They will simply not be accounted worthy to escape the wrath of God when they stand before him in soiled garments and having unrepentant hearts. They are the children of God who will receive their portion with the unbelievers, as if they were unbelievers themselves. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. 
It is the attitude of the lukewarm believers toward their master that is problematic, once again pointing to a lack of intimacy with him and therefore being positioned at the fringes of the field. They have no idea how much he hates sin, and they believe that they can live in sin without having to repent from it. Even though we are unable to live sinless lives, our attitude towards sin should not be to welcome it with open arms, and to expect no consequences because we are saved and sealed. Next I would like to show you another prophetic word that is quite exciting to listen to, especially concerning the owner's portion of the harvest that ties in with the first vision that we discussed. Let's listen. This prophetic word comes from Angie Stolba, Washington, Illinois. September, a time to emerge. Malachi 4.2 says, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. As I was seeking the Lord about the month of September, I heard the word, Emerge. According to the dictionary, the definition of emerge is as follows. To become manifest, become known. To rise from or come out into view. To rise from an obscure or inferior position or condition. Many have felt as though they have been drawn back. Their voice has been muzzled. They have seen momentum, but have found themselves recently in a quiet or seemingly dormant season. Perhaps even thoughts of being dried up and cast aside have clouded your view. But know this. You are not dried up, nor are you cast aside. In fact, the opposite is true. The Lord has been recalibrating you. You have been marinating and gleaning much, even though it has seemed quiet and you have not sensed much movement. Rest assured, your best days are still ahead of you. September will be a time to emerge and see the Lord's plans be accelerated. What was previously hidden will now come into view. Many of you have felt a battle over your voice and are in therefore taking your confidence. The enemy and even the slander of others has attempted to muzzle you. However, the Lord says no more. You shall now rise and go forth, emerge. Emerge with even greater clarity and heavenly direction. The swirling and the warfare you have encountered recently is going to lift and peace will be your portion. Watch for downloads and dreams in the night. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me because he is my right hand. I will not be shaken. Psalm 16, 7 and 8. Beloved, this is not a time to shrink back nor sit quietly on the sidelines. This is a time to wield your sword and emerge out of the very ashes of sorrow and defeat that the enemy attempted to keep you in. You shall do exploits and your confidence will will be restored as the Lord's favor is evident upon your life. Shake off the heartache. Shake off the disappointment of the past season and emerge. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8.31 Did you notice how the same withering and weakness were addressed in this prophecy, telling us once again that the owner's portion is being addressed here? When I listen to this prophecy, the passages that immediately come to mind relating to the word emerge are the following. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Finally, if you have been facing a lot of tribulation and persecution in your life for the sake of Jesus Christ, 
especially over the past five years. Be encouraged, because the time for being patient is just about over, and your reward is going to be out of this world. Even though you may feel withered and weak, as if God has forgotten about you, and perhaps wondering if your understanding of God's word with regards to the blessed hope is not just a fantasy, the tables will very soon be turned in favor of God's children. Your endurance and patience have refined you and made you a precious gem in the crown of your king, and the harvest that you will help to bring in will be exceedingly glorious to the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Heavenly Father is about to begin the greatest move this world has ever seen, and the enemy will be completely powerless to do anything, being caught red-handed, stealing from God's harvest. In these final days, before our appointment with our bridegroom, make sure that you repent of the sins in your life. Jesus is a holy God who will not compromise or accept sin to exist in His presence. He promises to forgive us if we confess our sins to Him. So if you have allowed sin to become part of your life, repent and confess it to Jesus so that your garments can be washed clean and so that you can stand before Him unashamed when He comes for those that are His. Also, do not rely on any of your own works to save you or to allow you access into His kingdom. And only by trusting in the blood that He shed for us on the cross and believing that He is the only begotten Son of God can He impute His righteousness to us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please listen to this final powerful prophetic word in which the same understanding is once again shared and also notice the references to the harvest and Satan's embarrassment that will soon be evident to all. God bless. Friday morning I went to prayer and uh, realized that the very onset it was unusual and I began to hear the voice. of the Lord speak to me. And for the last three days, God has been talking to me and I've been writing it down. So today I'm going to read to you what God has been speaking to me. The day of the Lord, the day of the Lord has come Come, my people, to Mark Carmel to see my glory, says the Lord of hosts. My little children, why have you trembled and feared at the evil that you are seeing in the earth? I am not moved or shaken at the roaring of the wicked, for their very breath I hold in my hand. I have delayed in answering the intercession of the righteous for time to expose the false prophets. I will not be manipulated by men who put words in my mouth that I have not said. Do not be moved by the damage that the delay of me coming has caused. I can, I will repair, and I will restore what the enemy has taken. This is the Elijah season. What you are seeing now is the spirit of Jezebel trying to cut the head off of John the Baptist. Just as I allowed Herod to behead James but not Peter, so now I won't allow the spirit of Jezebel to behead the prophetic voice that I have raised up in this hour, says the Lord. This time I am going to reverse in the earth What happened to John the Baptist, who was the Elijah of his day? This time, I'm going to cut off the voice of Jezebel. I have had much preparation to accomplish for this final harvest in the earth. Many have thought I was not involved in the affairs of men the last two years that I had stayed my distance because I did not hear the prayers of my people. But know this, I have been setting the stage for the greatest display of the sovereignty of my power that mankind has ever and will ever witness, saith the Lord. This has been a time of separating the goats from the sheep 
For there are many who call themselves Christians, but they are not. They, by their actions, have declared, we will serve the Lord, but by our rules, not by His. They have rewrote my Bible, they have changed my laws, and they have changed my commandments, and have said, if you want me, it'll be on my way and not yours. But they are arrogant and foolish to think that my words and my commandments can be changed by mere mortal men. It is not the wicked who have weakened the church in this hour, but it is the counterfeit Christians who have been a cancer in my body that have taken the very virtue out of my house. But because sentence was not executed speedily, they thought that I had overlooked or that I had accepted their ways. This time, saith the Lord, I'm going to judge the lukewarm just like I judge the wicked. There will be no separation. Watch now as I judge leaders who did not guard my sheepfold. Samson will grind at the wheel blind. Eli will fall off of his throne. And Saul will die at the hands of the enemy after I have finished cleansing my house and separating the sheep from the goats I'm going to turn my sheep into lions that will be loosed in the earth for this hour for this next season we require demons to become terrified of the church the majesty of my glory that is beginning to be released in this hour saith the Lord is not entertainment it is not the exaltation of the gifts of men but it is the divine holy presence presence of the Lord God Almighty. In the earth, hallelujah, will be fulfilled. The next two sovereign events that are going to occur will be the fulfillment of prophecy that the wealth of the sinner will be given to the righteous. There has been a Nabal spirit that has been withholding from the tabernacle of David that I am raising up in this hour, saith the Lord. I am going Going to force the wicked to release their wealth to my people because it's going to require much wealth to finance what I'm going to do in this time. You will know that wealth is beginning to change hands when you see me shake financial centers in Europe, in New York City, and the other continents around the world, and it will declare that the transfer of wealth has begun. I will will also bless my people for their many years of faithfulness. I'm going to bless you, my children, in such a way that there will be no way to contain the abundance. The words that you have declared, surely my cup runneth over, will no longer be a decoration of faith, but it will be the very experience, saith God, that I am opening the windows of heaven upon the children of the Lord, saith God. Because the enemy has tried to destroy and alienate my children with COVID. For every believer that has walked in faith, I am now going to heal, says the Lord of hosts. I'm also going to usher in and release in the church. And it will begin in the year 2022 in the fall. The church is now going to experience signs, wonders, and creative miracles, saith God. For it is my will that my body be completely healthy and whole to accomplish my sovereign will in the earth for the earth has looked at the church and say you say one thing but yet your power is deficient and we watch but nobody is really set free but this time saith God I will do miracles in such a way 
that no one will be able to say it was sleight of hand or manipulation or a trick. For arms will go out, saith God, where there was no arms. I will cause eyes to grow in sockets where there are no eyes, saith God. I am also coming after the spirit of autism that hell put upon the children of the godly men and women in this hour. And I am going to break that demon, says the Lord, because it is not of me. And then the children of the Lord that have not communicated were branded not strong mentally there will be a power of God hit them and as Saul prophesied and as Samuel prophesied so will your children prophesy did I not declare it saith the Lord that on the day of Pentecost this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy saith the Lord for there is much that is yet to be fulfilled that I have declared in my word and it has been so long coming that my children have begun to wonder is it just a fable is it just a good teaching but know this I don't work I don't move just to see myself move I don't talk just to hear myself talk but I will perform my word not one jot not one one tittle shall fall by the wayside. Nations that are called superpowers in the earth are not superpowers, for they have no power. For the power of a nation is not its army, but it's the God that rules over them. And the gods that rule over China and the non-gods that rule over Russia and the millions of gods that rule over India will not keep me out, saith the Lord, when I get ready to loose my sovereignty upon those nations. Rulers will stand and say, no, no, no. But heaven will declare and rejoice. Yes, yes, yes. You will remember when I do this, I'm now going to send a strong spirit of confusion to politicians and the wicked who have seized authority illegally over the nations. My book is a legal book. It is based on laws and the court of heaven. Therefore, I do not recognize, saith God, those that stand in places of leadership but seized it illegally. You will know that I am fulfilling this when you watch liberals and evil politicians and even the media online with live television turn on each other and begin to destroy each other, saith the Lord. I will cause them to uncover their underbellies. I will make them tell the lies that they have told and declare it was not true. My wrath has been stored up for this time, and I'm now going to release it, says the Lord of hosts. Just as there was a wailing in Egypt when I destroyed the firstborn, so shall there now be a wailing come up out of the earth for those who have just tried to destroy my people. For they have sat behind closed doors and said there is no God. We are God. And they have said there is nothing that can stop us from doing what we want to do. So they've killed your children. They have stolen your inheritance. They have robbed the widows. And they have caused the fatherless to be forsaken. As I cause Pharaoh, 
who was the king of kings at that time in the earth, bowed down and wailed over the loss of his own firstborn son. I am going to hit the weakness of those men and those women and I am going to begin to strip them of that which has been so important to them. And when I do, all of their attention will be on what they are losing. And they will no longer pay attention to what I am doing in the earth. For those, hallelujah, now the final battle for the church is going to unfold in the earth. This battle isn't going to be fought in natural realms. This is not a battle of buildings. This is not a battle of money. This is not a battle of talent. This is not a battle of who's who. This is not a battle about who has the greatest airtime or who has written the latest book. This battle is going to be fought, not in the natural realm, but in the domain of the heavenlies. This is not a battle, hallelujah. It is not the final battle, saith the Lord, that's going to occur between good and evil in the earth. But this is the last battle for the church. Before I remove her from the earth and bring my beloved whom I have longed for home to be with me saith the Lord the time is short the time is short the time is short look saith God look at thy garments are they clean saith the Lord regardless of the men that have said you can go to heaven and live in sin not so for I am a holy God I do not know sin I've never bowed down to sin there has never been sin in my house and I will not allow sin to come into my throne room saith the Lord so if there is sin Sin in thy life, saith God, get it out, for the days of repentance are coming to an end. For those that I have moved on, rebuked, and caused to be convicted, I have delayed bringing home my people. You call it the rapture. I call it homecoming. I have not brought my saints home. Because I said, though you go forth weeping, bearing precious seed, when you come back, you will bring your sheaves with you. So know this, saith God. This is the time that I'm giving sheaves to the house of God. And when you come home, saith God, you're not coming home empty-handed. You say, but Father, what are the sheep? The sheep are your children. The sheep are your family. The sheep are the fruit of thy womb. As you have wept over those that you have loved, and you've watched hell afflict them, bind them, cause them to become addicted, until you have wondered, Lord, is there any hope? This is the day of hope, saith God. This battle, saith God, is not a normal battle. This battle, saith the Lord, is really about the church stepping on the neck of the enemy. I make covenant with you this day, saith God. You will not bleed in this battle. You will not be cut in this battle, and you will not be wounded in this battle, saith the Lord. 
And yet those that are in this battle, say it gone, are covered with scars. But they're healed from other seasons and other time, saith the Lord. When you cross into heaven, saith God, your scars will be the medals that soldiers have wore when they have come out of battle victorious. They in heaven will come and say, what is this scar? And you will say, oh, this is when we had this victory, and this is what God did. You have thought, says the Lord, that you would want to speak to the apostles and to the prophets of the Old Testament for them to tell you firsthand the stories that you have read about. But I tell you, saith God, what you're getting ready to see, what you're getting ready to experience, has caused the great cloud of witnesses to stand to their feet. And they are watching, hallelujah, as you will walk in great victory and power. And when you cross over, they will say, tell us what it was like to be in that final movement. What was it like? to see the glory of the latter house and the former house. What was it like, not just for the former reign, but the former reign and the latter reign to fill the heavens and to wash the earth? And you will say, oh, it was glorious, and joy unspeakable and full of glory, says the Lord. The battlefield that the church is stepping on to will become the harvest field after it was the battlefield. Heaven has already decided the outcome of this battle. When this battle is over, the devil will stand embarrassed and demons will stand confused and say, what do we do now? I am now going to fulfill my word that I declared in Amos. The plowman is going to overtake the reaper because of the magnitude of the harvest that is coming into the house of the Lord. This will happen because I am shortening the laws of, of nature. I am going to abbreviate the time between planting and reaping, says the Lord. In the past, the waiting of harvest has made many of my servants weary. But this time, with great joy, shall they bring in the harvest. But to the churches that have created a famine in my house for the word of God so they could have temporary success and growth, know this, I am now going to send a famine of people to your houses and they will become empty tombs. And as they leave thy house, they will know that these people are not coming back, but they are finding houses where they can feast on the presence and the word of the Lord. I have said that I am getting ready to send the death angel into the earth. I am now looking at that angel, saith the Lord, and I'm getting ready to say, go and take the sword in thy hand. When the death angel comes to the earth, and know this, saith God, there are many who will challenge the word that I have released to my servant today and said, it is not the word of the Lord. Watch me, saith God, 
for I am going to fulfill this word. For in my mercy, I have allowed men and women of the past to challenge the prophetic word of the Lord. Now saith God, I am drawing a line. You will not challenge the word of the Lord because if you do, saith God, the judgment that is in this book is going to come upon thee. The death angel that will leave heaven, saith the Lord, is headed for the house of the Lord. For I declare judgment begins in the house of God. You are going to see platforms where there are musicians and singers that have practiced sin, know they are unclean, yet have no reverence for my presence, and think, I will be as others like Samson, and I will walk onto the house and the presence of God. But when they stand on the platform, they will fall dead as Ananias and Sapphira did, because this is not just another move. It's not a temporary display of my glory, but I am setting the stage for this is Satan. God, the final move of the Lord. When the angel is finished with the church and there will be men that the world has looked at and said they were fathers, but they were not. They were wolves in sheep's clothing. And as I begin to bring my judgment, I am going to uncover that which has been hid for decades. There are even men who are dead in the ground now, but lie with great reputation. I'm going to change that and uncover who they were when they were on the earth. Earth. Do you not know, saith God, that I said my house shall be called a house of prayer, and it will not be a den of thieves. In this hour, saith God, this judgment that's going to begin to take place will finish at the end of 2022, and then the angel of death will be released to the nations, and they will begin to walk into government houses. They will begin begin to walk into secret places. Uh, they will begin to walk into the dens of demons. Uh, and the hand of God uh, will be released, saith the Lord. Uh, for this is my hour. This is my earth. Uh, you are my people. Uh, and I will no longer bow down to sin in the earth. Uh, I'm going to raise up even sinners uh, who will stand in reverence for me, saith God. Uh, for I am a sacred God. Uh, I am a holy God. I am a righteous God, saith the Lord. And I have been maligned, pushed aside, spit on, and put down. But in this hour, saith the Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords is rising to his feet and shaking himself. Shout, saith God, for my word will come back fulfilled, saith the Lord. I'm hearing this in the spirit. The Lord says that just as the towers fell on September 11th to bring great fear in the earth and in this nation, God says, watch me this fall because I'm going to tear down the towers that the enemy raised up. And I'm going to put fear in them, saith the Lord. For they said, we will rebuild, we will rebuild. I say, saith God, what I am tearing down will never, ever be rebuilt. Parabobo <laughs> Sunday. The Lord says that the enemy has sinned against many of you distractions to take your attention away and to use up your virtue but the Lord says that's all they are is distractions do not worry says God about that which has taken virtue out of you and has caused you to lay awake at night put it on the altar says the Lord have I not already said that the damage that the enemy inflicts on you, I not only will repair, but I will make him give back 
seven times. Hallelujah. What he has stolen from you. In the name of Jesus, I loose an open heaven over God's people right now in the name of the Lord. God says, I am not, have I not said I am thy advocate? I am thy arbitrator. I am your lawyer, saith God. And today I stand as an intercessor between you and the eternal judge. And if you ask anything in my name, I will stand before the Father and I will pray it and I will do do what you ask in my name. This is your hour, saith God. Rise up, dry thy eyes. Get your harp off of the willow trees and begin to loose the song of victory in your spirit. Shake yourself, saith God, and declare it God before me. Nobody, nobody, nothing can stand against me. God says, get ready, because you're going to go into restaurants, and the Spirit of the Lord is going to settle down, and people will begin to weep and not know why. And the Lord said, when they begin to weep, you'll stand up, and you will begin to say, the Spirit of the Lord is in this house. And God said, I'm going to display my glory he said, in the middle of five-star restaurants, they'll stop drinking, and people will begin to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Harabobo Sunday. For up unto this time, saith God, my spirit has been confined inside of church buildings where only my people were. But I did not bring you into a building to just talk about to each other how good it is. The Lord said, I have raised you up to spill you out. And he said, every day get up now and expect. When you go into the grocery store, when you go into the service station, when you go into the restaurant, uh, your kids uh, are getting ready to walk. Do you not know why I'm anointing your children? Do you not know why I'm filling them with the Holy Ghost? Uh, because in the middle of their school classes, uh, the power of God uh, that's in your children is going to spill out. Uh, and the agnostic teachers, the atheist teachers uh, will not be able to stop it uh, because this is that, this is that, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. You are the people of prophecy. You are the church of the last days. You are the church that the fullness of the glory of God is being poured out on every nation, on every tongue, on every kindred by the power of God. May the fire of God begin to burn from one side of this building to the other side. May the Holy Holy Ghost power fall on you by the Spirit of the Lord. Jesus suffering on the cross is a picture difficult to understand. He was betrayed by a friend, arrested and falsely sentenced to death. He was beaten and whipped. A crown made of thorns pressed into his head. Bearing the cross, he stumbled and staggered up the hill to Golgotha. Each step of the journey getting worse, spit on, cursed, and mocked. But Jesus never looked back. He kept going. Jesus could have avoided the cross, called down fire from heaven, or summoned legions of angels to rescue him, to save him. But Jesus was not interested in saving himself. He was all about saving you. Every detail of this torturous path to the cross was part of God's plan to bring you to Him. We're all broken. We've all messed up and have all made wrong choices. And no one had to teach us as a baby about anger and selfishness. We just came out that way, sort of a sin covering. But on the cross, with His blood He shed, the Bible says, Jesus blotted out our record of sin, nailing it to his cross. The blood of Jesus washes away our sin covering. And his blood 
is our ticket. Our ticket to enter through a new door, a forever relationship door with God. So what do we do with this great news? The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, it's not enough to believe in Jesus with just your head. You must believe with your heart. Now, there's just one person alone at the foot of the cross. It is you. What will you say to Jesus? Say, thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood for me. I'm giving you my heart today, Jesus. I do believe you died for me and that you were raised from the dead for me. Please give me a new heart and a new life right now. God hears you and he is answering your prayer. The love of God is being poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit.